where do I begin? <laughs> Been here for so long, it's hard to say I want to step out of it. You know. Well, my sermon today, please be seated. My sermon today is on serving God with the right passion. But before I go there, I want to take this opportunity to just say a few words of appreciation. I'm grateful to God for the opportunity He has given me to serve Him through this wonderful ministry. Thank you, Pastor Ronnie, Pastor Pacer, Pastor Desmond, and all the pastors and staff of LE for the opportunity to serve alongside you all. And to all the leaders and members, I want to thank you for allowing me to come into your life. I want you to know that I love and treasure each and every one of you. I truly appreciate all of you. But I want to thank all my family members who are here with me this morning uh, for standing with me in the ministry, and especially to my dear wife, who has stood with me through thick and thin. And you can see more through thick than thin. And to this great Lighthouse family, I want you to know that my retirement is not a cessation of service to the Lord. I know that God still has much for us as a family to do. And I'm still very much of this family, very much a part of this family. I'm mindful of something that William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said some time ago. And I believe that all of us would want to emulate what he said. This is what he said. Well, there remains one dark soul without the light of God. I will fight. I will fight to the very end. As long as there's one dark soul that remains without the light of God, I will fight. I will fight to the very end. Beloved, we are called for this purpose and for this hour. The word is ours to take. Jesus gave us the mandate to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And we have declared that we want to be light of Christ everywhere we go. And that's what we must strive to do all the time. And thank God for this year of intercession that we have all called to pray. And I believe that we will give our hearts to it and that we will want to give our everything to, to, to participate, to be a part of all that God is going to do through the ministry. Now, before I get to the Word of God, shall I ask you to bow your heads with me as we speak to the God of the Word. Let's bow our heads. Father God, what an awesome privilege it is for us today to gather here in worship of your awesome name. And we do not take your presence lightly, nor do we, nor we dare to take it for granted. So we ask that you will come and make your presence known and felt in a real way. And now may the words of my lips and the meditation of all, my, all our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I've chosen for my text this morning, John chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. Let us read it, shall we? John chapter 6, verses 1 to 3. It says that after these things, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias, a large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up to the mountain and he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Jesus 
lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are this for so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there were much grass in the place. So the men sat down in numbers about 5,000, 5,000 men, but including the women and the children would probably be well above 25,000. You know, in those days, they don't raise family, they raise tribes. Jesus then took the loaves and having given thanks, he distributed it to those who were seated. Likewise, also the fish as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftovers, the leftover fragments, so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Now, if you know the drift of John's gospel, you will realise that he used the word signs to denote the miracles of Jesus. What is a sign? In John's gospel, a sign is a miracle of Jesus with a message. And John made no bones about this. In the last verse of the gospel of John, he said this, and there were many other things Jesus had done if every one of them were to be written and recorded in details, say so even if there were all the books in the world that were written about it, he says there could be no place to store them. But then in, in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, John tells us that he had chosen a few of the miracles that Jesus had done, seven in total. Seven miracles Jesus had done. And he said that, I chose this, have them recorded, so that you can be inspired to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And believing in Him, you will have eternal life. Now what was John saying? He was telling that Jesus had done many, many, many miracles but he had chosen the seven recorded in this gospel to prove that Jesus is the Son of God. So that as we read of these seven miracles that Jesus had done, we will believe that he is the Son of God and believing in him, we will have eternal life. Let me put it this way. John wants us to know that Jesus is the incarnate Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. He wants us to know that Jesus is worthy of our allegiance and service because He is our awesome God and He has no equal. The first point in my sermon today is our God has no equal. Equal. You know, in this account that we have just read, one principle actually stood out to me. And it's a principle that says this In God's economy, in God's economy, His supplies always supersede the demands. When we need it, he will supply it. You see, after feeding the, uh, the, the, the 5,000 men plus the women and the children, they could still collect 12 
basket full of fragments. You see, in God's economy, in God's working in our lives, His supply always supersedes our demand. That's the reason I believe Paul could boldly declare and said, my God shall supply all your needs according to His, gl- according to his glory, His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And indeed, God will supply all our needs. But of course, apart from this principle that His supply always supersedes the demand, we see three other things that will help us to see that Jesus has got no equal, the God we serve has got no equal. Firstly, in Jesus, we have a God in whom there is no problem too big for Him to solve. There is no problem too big for God to solve. In this passage, we are told that a large crowd followed Jesus to where He was because they saw the many healing signs that He had done. And when Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw the multitude, he said, he knew that they had not had anything to eat since following him. So he turned to Philip and said, where are we to get bread so that this might eat? Now John tells us that Jesus wasn't looking for an answer really. If you read the passage, you say, Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew what he wanted to do. But Philip did not. So Philip responded to Jesus in a way that would be how you and I would have answered him. But Lord, there's no McDonald's or no Burger King nearby. Where to get bread for this? And by the way, Lord, all the way here, I did not notice any gardenia or sunshine bakery. Where can we find bread in this forsaken place? Besides, to feed this amount of people, even 200 denarii, which was equivalent to, two, to a man's 200 days of wages, even then, won't be enough to get uh, to fill the stomach of the people. It could only buy a little to tickle everybody's stomach. You see, to Philip, to feed them would be a huge problem, but not to Jesus. Now, to cut a long story short, Andrew, another disciple, the brother of Simon Peter, told Jesus that there was a boy who brought along five loaves and two fish. So Jesus used them to feed the multitude. When each of them had taken and filled their stomach, there were still 12 baskets full of segment. God's supplies always supersede, if not equal, the demands. You see, there's no problems too big for him to solve. Personally, this has been my experience. I remember the very first paycheck that I got from the, from the church was $40. The treasurer came up to me. It, of course, I want you to know it's not in Lighthouse. Okay? It was in a very small church then. And the treasurer came up to me and gave me $40 and said, Pastor, uh, this is your one month's pay. I look at the meager amount. I took out one of the four read notes and I gave, to, gave, gave him and said, Brother, this is my tie. When I walk away from him, I can still recall very vividly the anxious feeling that I had inside of me. I asked myself, how am I going to maintain my family with this amount of money? How to keep my family going with $30 a month when it is hardly enough even to feed me alone? But I recalled what God said to me when I was contemplating coming to full-time 
leaving my secular work to come to full time. In Psalm 37 and verse 25, David said, I have been young, but now am old. But I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his children begging bread. You know, my wife and I, and my family at times, we all have, have experienced uh, uh, what, what I call not much most of the time. But there was never a time in our life that God allowed us to go hungry. He always prepared because His supply always, is always uh, greater than the demands. I, I want to share with you an account, you know. On one separate occasion, I remember struggling with, with, with the whole issue of finance. And I took a trip to KL, Kuala Lumpur, and there I met uh, Pastor Vernon Falls. Pastor Vernon Falls had a, had a training program in KL called the School of the Spirit. And he invited me to teach a class on praise and worship in his school. So I readily agreed, and I did not share with him nor anyone about my struggle at that point. But before the class uh, started, uh, he, he gathered all of us in his, in his office, all those who were teaching that night. And then we had a time of prayer. And during prayer, my mind kept gravitating towards how am I going to find enough finance to, to, to feed my family, you know, to, to go on in life. Anyway, we, we just went on praying. And after the prayer, I, I walked out of the office and was about to make, turn the corner to go up the stairs to the classroom where I was supposed to teach. And then I heard him sticking, uh, he heard him calling for me. His head was stuck out of the, of, of the classrooms, uh, of the office. And he called me, hey, Brother Clarence. Of course, then I paused, then I looked back. And he said, uh, uh, Margaret, ask me to tell you this. The Lord says not to worry about the money, I'll take care of it. And I was wondering, who, who told him that? <laughs> or who told her that? I've not shared this with anybody else of my, of my struggle. And here, God, through one lady whom I've not met, I tell you until today, I've not met Margaret, Vernon Ford's wife who had a word from the Lord about taking care. But I'm, 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 I will be quite candid with you over the, all these years. I have never had anything lacked. God made, God made sure that I have all my needs met. There is no problems too big for God to solve. Secondly, in Jesus, we have a God in whom no person is too small for him to use. No person is too small for him to use. Now, in the feeding of the multitude in this story, they seemingly have a huge problem that was solved by a little boy who was willing to give himself up, give his lunch up. Andrew Simon Peter found him, brought him to Jesus. And Jesus said, no, you're too, too young. You're too small. I can't use what you, you have with you. Jesus took whatever was offered, multiplied it, and used it to meet the needs. There is no person too small that God will not use. But this morning, I suspect that many of us may have been using age and inexperience as an excuse for not serving God. Of course, by age, I, I mean not just uh, the, the physical age. I'm also talking about your spiritual age. You may be old, but you, can't, you just recently gave your life to the Lord and, and you, you say, no, I, I, I'm too young. You know. But I want you to know the Lord wants to use you. Now, in this year, the year of intercession, I tell you the leadership wants everybody, young or old, experienced or not, 
to be a part of this, this program to intercede for what God wants us to do. We only have three things to pray for this church, to pray for the churches in Singapore, and to pray for our nation, isn't it? If the pastor come calling you, hey, come and join us in intercession. Please don't say, ah, so, no, lah, pastor, I'm sorry. I'm too new to the faith. I'm not good at prayer. I'm only a year, I'm only a one year or two year old Christian. I don't have the experience. No. You know, for praying, all we need is our mouth, a heart, and willingness, isn't it? This is the year of intercession. All of us are enlisted to this army. Can you hear the cry of God saying to us, I'm looking for a man or a woman to stand in the gap between him and lost mankind. Do you hear the call of God? And if the pastor comes asking you, hey, can you join a cell group? Can you be a part of a ministry? Don't say, oh, I'm too inexperienced. I just come to the Lord, you know, and I, I have not much knowledge and too new to the faith. Beloved, the question is not about your age, it's not about your knowledge, it's not about your experience. It is about your heart and your willingness. All we need is like a little boy, willing to give Jesus Willing to you are all to Jesus. I remember when I first came, in, came into the faith, came to, came to the Lord, I volunteered to this, uh, volunteered with this organization called Volunteers for Christ. I was just a, a, a one over year old Christian. And they sent me to St. Matthew's Church down at Near Road. And they say, go and help the church. I remember going to the church, not knowing anything. And I, I met the pastor who was Reverend Poole then. You know. Reverend Poole said, good, Clarence, you want to serve? Come, 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 come. And we, he sat me down and he told me this. He said, uh, Brother Clarence, basically I'm a Cantonese preacher. So I tell you what, I'll take one Sunday a month in terms of preaching. you take three Sundays. He said, I will... I will leave the prayer meeting to you. Every Wednesday, you handle the prayer meeting. And be, after the service at 10, you take care of the young adults. I was virtually the pastor thrown into a deep, you know. And I went to a friend of mine who was a pastor then in another church. And he said, no, no problems, Clarence. Every Tuesday, you just come to my place and you get your sermon ready. We will run through it. So every Tuesday I was at his house, we ran through what I've written, and then Sunday I preached it. Well, all we need is willingness, regardless of age, whether in faith or age in our physical, uh, our physical age. There's no person too small that God will not use. I want to particularly emphasize today that please don't give the excuse that I can't pray. This is the year of inter intercession. We all can pray. We all can say something. We can pray for the church. If we feel a part uh, uh, of this church, feel a part of what God is doing in our nations through the churches, we want our nation to be prospering. We all can pray. We need a revival. We need everyone, young or old, to be a part of this prayer. So there's no problems too big for God to solve. And there's no person too small for God to use. And then, thirdly, in Jesus, we have a God in whom no gifts, no gifts is too insignificant for him to multiply and minister to life. There's no gift. You cannot say I have no talent. I, my talent is so insignificant. All of us have talents, have giftings that God has given to us. And we can use it. No, you know, in this account, in this account, we saw how Jesus used the offering of a boy 
insignificant loaves of barley bread. You know, I heard that barley bread, barley loaves, was the, the lowest grade of bread in those days. But Jesus took this seemingly insignificant loaves, give thanks, bless it, broke it, multiply it, and serve the multitude. Because there's no gift too insignificant for Jesus to use, for Jesus to multiply, for Jesus to, to really use it and minister to life. I want you to know that the miracle here is about the miracle of multiplication. It didn't just happen in the hands of Jesus. Now, sometimes when we think about a loaf of bread, we always think of a loaf of gardenia. But in the context of John, it is more like a piece of roti prata or a chapati or a pita bread that we know today. You know, how can we hold a whole or 10 loaves and begin to give? But they can hold 10 roti prata and give, isn't it? You know? and, and as they give out to the multitude, I believe the, the bread literally multiplied in their hands. You see, there's no gift too insignificant for God to use. See, our God has no equal and there's no problems too big for Him to solve, no person too small for Him to use and no gift so insignificant that He cannot receive, multiply it and minister to life. If this is true, then we want to, want to ask ourselves a question. It begs a question. How then should we serve God? Serve a God like this? My straightforward answer to us here this morning is this. Let us serve Him with the right passion. So that's my second point. So we want to serve God with the right passion. But how to serve God with the right passion? I find the answer in an ancient text that Paul had written to his protege, Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul said this, Be diligent to present yourself, approved to God, as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. I, I ask myself, what kind of a man or a woman would it take for God to use and make an impact in our challenging world? You know, there is a serious meltdown in our world. But what would it take, what kind of a man would it take for God to use to impact this world. In this verse, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul points out the three things that you and I must cultivate if we are to be that person that will make impact in this world. We need, firstly, to cultivate a passion for the Lord. A passion for the Lord. He says, do your best. Do everything you can. Make your best effort to present yourself to whom? To God. As an approved workman, present yourself to God. Have a passion for the Lord. We must be like Jesus who said, my, my meat is to do the will of, of him who sent me. Jesus said, I delight to do thy will, O God. A passion for the Lord. The question I ask is today is, do we have a passion for the Lord? If you want to be that person that will impact the world today, we need to have a passion for the Lord. Then secondly, in this verse, we also need 
to have or need to cultivate a passion for excellence. Paul says, do your best. Do your best to present yourself to God. Do your very best. You see, in this text, there's only two kinds of workmen that, that, that Paul was talking about. One that is a proof of God and one that is ashamed of the work. I submit to you that the, the ashamed workmen demonstrate two things. Low quality, no sacrifice. People who were not sacrificed for the work of God nor produce very low standard of work. It is said that talent is cheap. Talent is cheap. But dedication is costly. Talent is cheap. Dedication is costly. There is always a price to be paid if we want success, if we want significance. A passion for the Lord and the passion for excellence. And finally, we need to cultivate a passion for the Word. Do your best to present yourself as a workman to God and not an ashamed one. Rightly dividing the Word of truth. Have a passion for the Word of God. You see, in, in this, the way, he, he, the, way the, 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 the sentence is structured, and in the original language, handling, rightly handling the word of truth, it, it, it has, it's very picturesque in a sense. It's like, uh, uh, like you are in a mountainous area, and you, you, you uh, use something, use a tractor or something to cut, your, cut through for yourself a straight path so that you can come to where you want to come to. Cut for yourself a straight path so that you can arrive at the destination that you want. I propose to you that to be handling the Word of God rightly is talking about accuracy and clarity. Accuracy in interpreting the Word of God and Clarity in presenting the Word of God. Do your best to understand the Word of God. Interpret it rightly. Because you see, I, I always maintain this, this, this position that our application of the Word can only be as accurate as our interpretation of it. When we interpret the Word wrongly, our application will be wrong. So we need to handle the Word of God rightly. Have an accurate interpretation of the Word. But we also need to present it clearly. So we need to cultivate a passion for the Lord. Cultivate a passion for excellence. We need to cultivate a passion for the Word. I want to leave for us, three very useful questions, I believe, so that at the end of each day, perhaps we can take this question and ask ourselves. The first question, is the Lord well pleased? In my life, is the Lord well pleased? Second question, is the work well done? Is the work well done? Thirdly, is the word well lived? Is the word well lived? So, is the Lord well pleased? Is the work well done? Is the word well lived? I want to invite you to stand to your feet together with me as we go to the Lord in prayer. 
I'm going to take a few minutes. I want you to take a few minutes in this time. Would you talk to the Lord in a personal way? Dedicate yourself to Him. Tell Him what you want Him to do with your life. Tell Him that you truly want to be a part of this movement that He is setting forth that we are already on the launching pad. We are ready to move at his impulse. Would you take this few brief moments and talk to God? God, our Father, for all that you have done for us, there's no word that can ever adequately express the gratitudes of our hearts. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your invitation to work with you. We recognize that our calling into this kingdom of God is not just to touch it, but to enlarge it. We are called into this ministry in Lighthouse Evangelism, not just to be sitting on the pews or on the seats, but to be a vibrant participant of the work that you have assigned to this ministry. God will hear your mandate to be the light of Christ everywhere we go. And we hear the mandate for this year to be intercessors for Christ. Lord, we dare not take this mandate lightly because we know that ultimately we have to come before you and give an account for what has been assigned to us. We want lighthouse to to fly, Lord. But more importantly, we want your kingdom to fly. We want the churches in Singapore to thrive. We want this nation to be protected and that we will have the peace of God in this nation for us to continually do the work of God. Lord, this is our desire. We want to see the name of the Lord lifted high for your promises that when He is lifted high, when you are lifted high, you will draw all men to yourself. Lord, without condition, without reservation, for the future of this church, for the future of the kingdom and for the future of our own lives, we delight to give ourselves to you for the work that you want to do. Lord, would you take each and every one of us today as we yield them to you and ask God that you will use it for the expansion of your kingdom. May the kingdom of God, as Jesus taught us to pray, come on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you, Father. We give you all the glory, all the praise, it is our delight, it is our desire. And for all this, we give you thanks in Jesus' precious name. Come on, let's give God a good hand, shall we?